We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are, are all united. united. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the workshop, Money Can't Buy Me Digital Literacy. My name is Fia Resgado, and I'm delighted to share today's discussion in collaboration with my colleague, Sabrina Vorbao, who is the online uh, moderator. This workshop is organized by the InSafe Network, the European uh, Network of Safer Internet Centers, in cooperation with the Portuguese, Belgium, German, and Greek Safer Internet Centers. When we are talking about economic and social inclusion in the field of digital literacy, the digital divide is a widespread concept we cannot go past. The term digital divide has in the past been referring to the gap that exists in most countries between those with ready access to the tools of ICT and possessing relevant knowledge to use certain tools and those without such access. The session will discuss the role of economic, social and cultural capital within the current digital divide. How is media and digital literacy predicted by these types of capital? And how can we prevent certain inequalities to maintain themselves? Is, in this regard, the session will highlight that prevention of digital exclusion is a work in progress that goes beyond access and is a shared responsibility of various stakeholders to ensure an equal and safe internet for all citizens. While different opinions will remain on what instruments, measurements are the most appropriate to achieve this, it should become clearer which initiatives and resources are available to support more awareness and education in this area. Today's workshop will run for 90 minutes. We will kick off with a 30 minute panel discussion hearing from academia, safer internet centers, technical community and youth representatives, drawing up on the following question. Challenge the digital device. What does your stakeholder group or region demand to bridge the digital divide? In this regard, I'm delighted that I have been joined on site and online by Sonia Livingstone, Katrin Morask, Evangelia Daskalaski, Rodrigo uh, Nem, and Emmanuel Nikora. Following the panel, we will be able to discuss amongst uh, yourselves as we will host different breakout rooms, lead by different stakeholders and experts in the field about efforts that have been put in place to tackle the digital divide on digital literacy. However, with any further ado, I'm pleased to give the floor now to Sonia Livingston, who is a professor in the Department of Media and Communications at London School of Economics and Political Science. She has published 20 books on media audiences, including Parenting for a Digital Future, How Hopes and Fears About Technology Shape Children's Life. She has advised the UK government, European Commission, European Parliament, UN Committee on the Rights of the Child, OECD, ITU and UNICEF and others on children's internet safety and rights in the digital environment. She directs the Digital Futures Commission with the Five Rights Foundation and Global Kids Online with UNICEF. Welcome Sonia and the word is yours. Brilliant. Uh, thank you so much. And it's a pleasure to be um, here virtually with everyone to discuss um, this really important topic. Um, so uh, you just heard about a number of my projects. You can see that I'm a, an academic researcher and I very much um, try to uh, collaborate with um, key organizations who are making a difference um, in, the, in the world through um, direct participatory work with children. 
Um, there are many things um, I might say to kind of kick off this discussion and many projects, but I thought I would um, share slides and really tell you just about one project to give you some um, academic research and findings. And um, let me just, um, so I think you can now see my screen, right? Um, and to really focus on this question of social inequality and to talk about a little about the pandemic um, and to bring the, the, the voices of children in, though I know this is also Katrin's um, focus. So I thought I would just outline one project. So this is really my only slide um, and let me talk you through it because during the pandemic, it was um, uh, on, on behalf of myself and colleagues in the Global Kids Online project, we were very, i um, pleased to work with the COVID under 19 work. The COVID under 19 project um, was a big collaboration of many child rights organizations who were interested in how children's rights were being affected um, across the world and in relation to a whole host of different um, issues. And from Global Kids Online, we brought in the theme of the digital environment and we asked, what does the digital environment mean? Um, so I'm thinking about the question Sabrina asked in advance, you know, what what should we have known before the pandemic? What do we know now during the pandemic? What difference did the digital make? And the story here is um, is very heavily about um, inequalities, about the importance of social, cultural and economic capital. Uh, and about um, all the other kinds of inequalities. So if I begin um, in the red box on the top left, um, we saw immediately, this was responses from um, 26,000 children across 137 countries in all um, five UN regions. Uh, and um, we asked them a series of questions. Um, we see, first of all, um, that while many children around the world had some access to the internet, there were really big inequalities. And we tried to look for inequalities, not only in terms of um, income uh, and geography, but also we um, had responses from children who were um, migrants, asylum seekers, living in detention centers, refugee camps, homeless centers, um, and so forth. So we see big differences, regional differences, um, in access, but also big differences within each region. Bottom left, the online um, safety, uh, we um, immediately see that actually most, we, we, we asked a lot of before and after questions before the pandemic, after the, or during the pandemic. Uh, children felt less safe during the pandemic online. Uh, young children aged eight to 10 especially felt less safe. Um, and children who'd not accessed the internet before and had to go online because of the pandemic felt less safe. Uh, in the middle, in the yellow box, we asked a lot of questions about education. Um, and here too, the story is kind of a depressing one. I know there's been a lot of talk about how the pandemic gave children access to uh, technology that they'd never had before, and perhaps it did. Um, but broadly, children felt their education had been better before the pandemic. Um, they got better support from their teachers. They are now, after the pandemic, more worried about their grades. Um, and so the, the kind of the human dimension um, and the and the face to face dimension of education, I think, has become very salient to children as something that um, is, is, is vital. Technology can complement this. But if they have to rely on it, is there's a problem. Uh, pink at the top, the pink box. Um, we saw a lot of children using technology to stay in touch, and this was really, really important to them. But we also saw um, some concerns about um, mis and disinformation. Though interestingly, um, children mainly rely for information on family and friends, and they continue to do that through the pandemic. But of course, the information environment provided a, um, uh, a challenge to their digital literacy, and a lot of what they saw online was mediated through this, this social um, interaction. 
and this was a this was a participatory project um, to um, ensure children's voices are heard. So at the end, we asked them all, what would what would they like their um, what do they want their government to know? What did they want to tell them? Um, and they really wanted to um, talk about um, child friendly um, digital resources um, and the importance of that. Um, and yes, the digital environment is absolutely vital to their um, their rights and their expression and their education. But let us not forget the wealth of kind of cultural and social and personal um, uh, context that that frames that. Um, so I just leave you a note about the Global Kids Online um, project that that we brought this this knowledge to. We um, a blog not too often but um every now and again with new findings um it's a good place to get um resources about um uh, cross-national um projects on children online and with that i will stop thank you so much uh, thank you very much sonia for giving us the research context and and uh, and finds and let me now turn to Katrin Morask, who is representing the, the Youth Voice. Katrin started as a youth panelist for ClickSafe and took part in several other events as Safer Internet Forum, Safer Internet Day, Erodic, and IGF. Since then, she has uh, developed an interest in digital law and uh, politics. Welcome, Katrin. Uh, over to you. Thank you. Oh, uh, thank you as well. So the, the last weeks and days I've been talking to a lot of young people all around Europe about um, yeah, the question of the, the digital divide and um, they basically all came up with three main themes and points and um, it is uh, interesting that they really didn't um, had any connection to the um, to the pandemic, which was something which kind of surprised me because also for me, I think it was like the overeating uh, point uh, the last two years. But um, it seemed that uh, for the the young people I talked to, um, this wasn't this wasn't the point. So they kind of tried to outline like the three biggest problems they see and of course if you know what the problem is uh, you maybe can try to to solve it so the first one um, something Sonia you also uh, mentioned is of course the, the education and the educational system so what um what we saw and what we see is that of course the educational systems uh, around the world are totally totally different and that's obviously uh, pretty obvious that um, this is the, the this is the point um, but also it is pretty obvious that we are saying it needs more education uh, for many many years now and I think it's slowly is slowly starting but uh, when you think about media literacy it is still yeah and not at that point we would like to have it and of course if you are not educated in different points of course this leads to um, a really big digital divide if some people are educated in it and others are not. And especially if we have like the, of course, the European outlook, but I think also the, the outlook around the world, I think we also see that there are um, yeah, dramatically um, decreases um, in the digital divide, of, um, which comes back to, to um, education. The second point, which was pretty obvious, was that uh, young people don't feel that they are taken seriously. The, the one example was that there was a, one person who was um, flagging uh, some stuff on, uh, reporting some stuff on Instagram. And I think he said that he reported five different things. And what, what is happening is that you get all those robotical replies. And then it took around two weeks to, um, that they work with this request and then, that the, the output was, I think one was um, deleted and the other ones, they said, uh, sorry, there's too much going on right now. We can't um, handle your problem. And what he said is that this for him led to the point that he was, he didn't understand why, why they are doing this. It was too difficult to, to go through this process. And what the ultimate end of this is that he said that some people maybe from his from his friends who are aware that there are problems with different posts that they try to 
deport them, but if nothing's happened, then afterwards, only people who are really into those, into this field and into we have to do something will go on with doing this and other people will just take it like this and maybe if you then go to them and say okay you have to work on uh, on your literacy and you have to check what is um, going on online and they are yeah kind of reclined that they don't really want to do anything about that um, anymore and so what we also then see is that you really don't have kind of the support from, from the, the platforms they are using, but you also don't have support from, I think, I mean, you, we try to give them support from governmental and non-governmental agencies, and we are trying to uh, have helplines with all of that, but a lot of people aren't aware or maybe don't have a phone or whatever to call those helplines if they see something like this on platforms and they don't know how to handle it, and then the platforms can't manage to get um, them the ideas themselves. So this is also a really big problem. And of course, the, the third really big issue, of course, is accessibility. I think that's also something we've been seeing uh, for a lot of years now, um, kind of divided into like, of course, the hardware. So we, of course, want governments to subsidize the cost of laptops and tablets within, within schools, but we also see the connectivity issues. And of course, you really need to have good connectivity and reliable applications and devices to, to work um, on, on your schoolwork and to not only do your schoolwork, but also be an active part of the society for young people. The biggest part of their lives is being connected online and if you don't have the chance of course the the divide is also there getting bigger and, and bigger and also thinking about software you there still also have people who maybe can't afford uh, microsoft office programs i mean they're really really expensive for especially for families who maybe you know have to have to um, really fight with a lot of um, their money to get um, a computer for the whole family, but then also those programs are quite expensive. And this is also something where you compromise the education of some people only because they don't have so much money. And of course, that again leads to all the problems that, which can come afterwards. And also we have um, the, the accessibility for some some people you know especially when you are uh, kind of you have a disability and you then go to school and you still have problems throughout your whole normal and offline life this also gets more and more important in in the online life that maybe you can't read so much or that you maybe can't understand because it's not in an easy language or that you yeah, just don't understand how programs work and all that stuff also leads to yeah a, a digital divide there. So of course, the, the bottom line I say is that we see that we have those digital dividers within those three biggest, biggest problems. And yeah, ultimately, I think just really tackling those problems uh, via a big, uh, big step of you know governments and society all together can only yeah tackle those three problems so i think that's what uh, our output um, of the the talks the last weeks were thank you very much catherine for giving us the youth perspective and identifying these uh, three uh, big problems uh, Evangelia uh, Daskalaki represents the Greek Safer Internet Center, where she is the IT manager. She is a PhD candidate at the Hellenic uh, uh, Mediterranean University, and her PhD thesis is about researching AI techniques to eliminate harmful content for children and audiovisual media services online. Thank you, Evangelia, for being in person, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much for Sofia. Hello, everybody. My name is Evangelia Daskalaki. Um, as Sofia has mentioned, um, I'm working for the Foundation of Research and Technology Hellas, and uh, particularly for the Greek Safer Internet Center. So when it comes to Greece and our theme, of course, uh, the digital divide, uh, as you may have heard in the news, we have a lot of problems. <laughs> um, so um, the first uh, and 
problem we have, of course, is the percentage of poor people in Greece due to the economy. But uh, this, of course, has worsened because of the pandemic. So uh, this is the first one. And then uh, we have another um, issue that we handle. And this is that Greece was in the front line of the refugee crisis. So, uh, as you may have heard, over 120,000 people have entered the borders of Greece uh, from 2015, when uh, this old crisis started. And uh, many thousands of them are still staying in Greece. Um, so, these are the... Um, uh, two uh, themes that we in the Greek Safer Internet Center have um, uh, started projects uh, to uh, really support uh, um, the children that are affected from these two different groups, these two different focus groups we have. So I will start with the second one that we recently started uh, doing this, uh, this project where we are focusing on the refugee children and uh, closing the gap, uh, the, the digital divide that there is uh, with uh, the average child in, in Greece and the digital literacy an average child receives in Greece uh, compared to um, no uh, a digital literacy that those children already have. So um, we, uh, we, we wanted to come uh, close to the children and the only way to do this was to really go to them and to ask them to like, um, not them of course, the children themselves, but uh, the caregivers. So we um, invited 40 NGOs from Greece and we uh, we came together, and the facilitators, the, the facilitators of the Greek children, uh, in order to show them first of all the material that we have um, uh, from various themes that we could think that they had uh, um, that they lack of information. Uh, so, uh, but then we didn't know, of course, what the situation was. So the first thing we did is showing them, showing them the material we have. So uh, it, this was a process of train the trainer. So train them uh, in order to train the children. And uh, after this workshop that we had with those NGOs, uh, we also ran a survey. So we asked them, what are the real needs of the children? We have shown you what we have, but now we want you to answer, what is the real problem of these children? And there was a huge gap there because some of the NGOs answered, what are you talking about? These children have nothing. These children cannot ha have no access. They have no, uh, they have no devices. They have nothing. And then the other answers we got is like, oh, excessive use is a problem we have. So it was like uh, we we had to balance all these th things. And um, uh, another uh, really interesting thing that came up was hate speech, of course. Uh, they uh, we have to provide material for hate speech. Uh, we had to provide uh, material for um, gender uh, violence. Uh, because of, as you understand, uh, this we have different cultures, different uh, perspectives of things, and um, uh, and uh, yes, so uh, these were the different themes they asked us: sexting, um, exchange very intimate uh, pictures, um, and uh, the last thing, and most important, as I can understand, is. Uh, that they needed this material in their own languages. So uh, we got this request from everybody that, um, uh, okay, uh, this material is great. Thank you for giving us. We will pass it on. But uh, still, these children have to, to be uh, uh, able on their own to really understand what is written here, apart from us or the translators. Sometimes we cannot even communicate with them because we can. Uh, the translator is not always, always there. So um, we got a request to translate our material in 15 different languages and dialects. So this 
is, as you understand, is very, very difficult. Uh, but uh, we are in the process now to find translators for at least three languages for the most important themes and to uh, really try to uh, uh, accommodate all the needs, uh, not all, but some of the needs of these children and to provide to them whatever we can, material, whatever we can for these children. And for the second problem uh, in Greece um, about uh, poverty, of course, and the pandemic on top of it, uh, well, we are in close connection with the municipalities who is the um, structure that these uh, children uh, come to uh, because some of them don't attend even school. Uh, so uh, this is our only way to come in contact with these children, the municipalities, the different municipalities of Greece, and uh, provide them with, uh, again, uh, with um, the program of Train the Trainer and with material we have in our own language. So. Um, uh, this is uh, the two big uh, projects that we run right now in the Greek Safer Internet Center. And I know that all the safer internet centers of uh, Europe and of the InSafe network are really doing their best to um, close this gap, the digital divide. And um, thank you so much for having me today here. And uh, we, we will do our best. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Evangelia, for giving us the, the Safer Internet uh, Center perspective uh, on uh, uh, how to approach uh, the digital device and the example that you gave about uh, the, the refugees. Uh, and now I'm going to pass the floor to Rodrigo, who represents the civil society and Latin American uh, region. At the Brazilian SaferNet, Rodrigo is the eSafety and Awareness Director. Uh, where he coordinates the national educational campaigns to promote digital citizenship and e-safety awareness, including uh, Brazilian Safer Internet Day, training trainers, promoting uh, workshops to law enforcement authorities, and strengthened youth participation at internet governance and public policies agenda related to online privacy and safety. Welcome, Rodrigo, and the word is yours. Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for this presentation. And it's a big pleasure to be here again with you all and participate at the, the IGF again. Uh, well, I will share uh, some perceptions and comments from our work in uh, civil society in Brazil, uh, working around human rights and uh, digital citizenships, uh, uh, digital citizenship with teenagers, educators, but also with uh, many other stakeholders. Uh, and it's key uh, to recognize that, uh, for sure, the pandemic uh, highlighted the still huge digital exclusion uh, of the previous families. Uh, and this uh, make uh, some reflections about how uh, the use of internet is connected with all these uh, uh, challenging inequalities, both uh, in access, but also in abilities to use in a safe and critical use uh, this technology that that were the, the only option for many many activities on the daily life of, of all of all. So the same uh, uh, violence that uh, we we face on on the cities and the urban urban violence that we have in Brazil uh, are reflected uh, when we had this all digitalization of uh, uh, many public services and all the schools and other. A space that uh, the families had to go uh, to have their uh, uh, rights and their, their needs. Uh, and this uh, reflection of inequalities and violence uh, were, uh, was explicitly uh, regarding children, women, and vulnerable groups that uh, had growing, growing uh, vi online violence. And we received many more uh, reports uh, from uh, this kind of violations during the pandemic. And other issue that we face in Brazil that with the social isolation uh, uh, regarding the pandemic, domestic violence, for example, uh, grows a, a lot in Brazil. And also these uh, uh, vulnerable groups 
were, was targeted by uh, online violence in the schools, on meetings, online meetings, racism and misogyny and other kinds of uh, 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 violence uh, reflected on online space. It's critical. One example of uh, how digital literacy is key, uh, not only for children, is that uh, many poor families uh, have received, received this kind of emergence benefit from the government. And to access this benefit, they had to have uh, offshore applications and access by the cell phone or others. And many frauds and scams uh, start to happen with these families fake offshore apps uh, using this uh, emergent situation to, to, to stall and, 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 and have this fraud and, and these more vulnerable uh, communities were again more vulnerable uh, to access digital services uh, without any other alternative. The same about the misinformation about vaccines and all these uh, uh, literacy questions. And here again, teenagers and youth people were key as the reference for the families with a minimum access uh, to information and the minimum condition to make a criticism uh, approach about all these uh, uh, informations. And despite being incipient, digital literacy at schools made difference for our more vulnerable families in this uh, pandemic period in Brazil. It's important also for us to highlight that in countries like Brazil, there is not a linear progression in relation to rich countries. It's not about receiving in the future the same digital issues and problems that in Europe or in the US you had before. We must to deal with the, all issues at the same time with our specific and singular context and respond to that not only locally, but also considering global problems. And as a country, we have a, a kind of a problem with the fragmented public policies uh, and this challenge around universal access to the internet with digital literacy uh, with that. So it, for us, it's important to highlight that how urgent it is to change the approach around digital literacy, not only as a challenge for elementary schools, we need to raise uh, digital literacy as a high priority considering all these new challenges uh, in the new world of work and the impact of artificial intelligence uh, on the dynamics of the cities, for example. And to conclude, it's key to highlight also that the fragility of uh, uh, democracies and all the rise of gover governments that do disrespect the human rights uh, threaten the important recent achievements we have in the laws and the regulatory frameworks uh, in Brazil, especially for the digital rights. Uh, it's uh, well known, uh, uh, for you that multi-stakeholder approach uh, means shared responsibilities. And a strong and secure civil society is vital to fight for human rights. And ethical technology companies need to publicly reinforce their civic commitment to the well-being of people, not just as consumers and markets, but as citizens. And in Brazil, you feel that uh, need for more commitment uh, with uh, companies also. In times of growing asymmetries of power in different levels of artificial intelligence, we as civil society, especially here in Global South, we need to have resilience to deal with these disruptive dynamics with so many ubiquitous technology. And I hope and I believe truly that we can also create with digital technologies disruptive innovations to face economic and social inequalities. I hope that we can strengthen human rights and well-being indicators as the base for the complex process of digital creation, transformation, regulation, and why not avoidance of disruptive technologies that is clearly uh, having bad consequence for our societies. And I'm sure that we will achieve that considering your children and vulnerable groups, not only to inspire our work as we have here in SafeNet, but to make change and to work with us together as different stakeholders to make this change happen. And we learned with the pandemic that it's not ideas that we need. We need actions, concrete actions and concrete change in our daily lives, but also at the public policies level to implement change and not only to conceive and, and create uh, problems, but to implement that to change, change our uh, lives in, in daily basis. 
So uh, that's my first contribution. Uh, thank you again for the opportunity. Um, thank you very much, Rodrigo, for giving us the Global South perspective on the digital device and the problems uh, that you are facing. Uh, Emmanuel Nicora represents the, the tech community and uh, Africa region. Emmanuel is a tech expert with extensive experience in the areas of ICT skills and capacity development, boosting and bridging digital skills gap for youth, integration of ICTs into education and training uh, institutions. Uh, he is currently a program officer at the International Te Telecommunication uh, Union, and he is based in the ITU uh, area office for West Africa, Dakar, Senegal. He is the ITU Regional Focal Point for Skills and Capacity Development for Africa, coordinating the work of the uh, ITU Centers of Excellence Network and Digital Transformation Centers uh, in Africa. Uh, welcome, Emmanuel, and the word is yours. Uh, thank you very much uh, for having me, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. So, yeah, as uh, already presented, uh, I'm going probably to focus on um, uh, the work we are doing with youth be uh, because I happen to be coordinating uh, what we call Generation Connect uh, uh, Africa Youth Invoice. So this is doing on the, on the ITU strat youth strategy. So the ITU established uh, uh, regional youth groups. And, and in Africa, we, we have one of the, the, the groups uh, uh, of uh, uh, around 26 young people. So probably I'm going to start with uh, their, uh, because I've been working with them from uh, for, since um, uh, the beginning of the year. So trying to, 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 hear, their, to, to hear their voices, their concerns, their, their contributions to the work that I2 is doing, but also the concerns of, of young people in general in Africa. So during the, uh, the sessions that we had with them, just to, uh, so that we, they can come up with the, like, like, uh, a declaration document that is going to be shared with the uh, African uh, governments uh, during uh, and, and, and uh, during uh, 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 like a regional, uh, uh, regional preparatory meeting of uh, WTDC is a uh, uh, ITU uh, World Communication uh, Development Conference. So the youth came together and uh, uh, and uh, and uh, uh, looked at different uh, thematic priorities and and the digital inclusion and digital divide was one of them. And uh, one thing that came strongly we, we, <coughs> in that probably I would like to mention is that uh, in Africa, the youth feels that uh, the, uh, the, 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 I mean, the governments or the other partners should, should try to achieve universal broadband access. So, and they declared that the, the internet at the moment should be not be considered as a luxury, that is for the rich people, for the government officials, should be considered as a basic human right. That is uh, in response to what happened during the pandemic, where uh, most of uh, schools uh, uh, were going to online. Uh, so the issue of internet came up and, and, and the youth felt that the, the governments, the African governments and with other partners with the, uh, coming together, the internet should be, uh, uh, should be considered as a human, a human, a basic human right, such as water, electricity, transport. Those are the infrastructures considered as a basic uh, uh, infrastructure for, 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 uh, for all, um, uh, all governments. So the internet, internet infrastructure should also be part of those uh, basic uh, uh, infrastructure requirements. So, uh, 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 that's the, what, what came a, a number of, uh, 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 priority actions, they called for a number of priority actions, and uh, probably I'm going to come to that uh, a bit later, but I, speaking to my personal uh, experience first, so on the topic of uh, digital, uh, digital divide, so uh, first of all, uh, when the, during COVID, uh, like schools, um, yeah, because we're talking about uh, digital literacy, uh, schools uh, went online, during the pandemic, not, uh, because the schools first were closed, and after being closed, so uh, the governments and Ministry of Education they tried to uh, move square schools uh, online, but that this this was not possible to around maybe 
95%. I'm talking about the, the Africa. So one thing that maybe I'm going to talk about on, on three layers. The first is uh, access. So the first layer at the bottom is access to digital infrastructure. So that is, first of all, an issue and the, the, where we, we are seeing a digital divide in that area because the internet uh, in, the, in, the, in the large cities, uh, this is, I mean, the implementation of uh, uh, ICT infrastructure, telecommunication infrastructure in the big cities is being uh, handled by, uh, by telecom operators because of uh, it's the, the, their business viable, so they, could, they, can, they can implement. But the larger parts of Africa in rural areas, the internet connectivity is still, uh, uh, still not possible because there the, the infrastructure for, for business-oriented uh, uh, telecom operators is not viable. It's not, uh, uh, they don't get benefits in those rural areas because of the poverty, colleague, uh, I think my previous speaker talk, 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 talk about. So they don't, we don't there's that lack of access in larger parts of, 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 of the continent, which again creates a digital divide between the rich and the poor within those uh, uh, hard to reach regions or rural uh, areas. So that's on the access level. So uh, then, uh, this, the, on the, uh, then the second layer is on the affordability. Even when, when there's access to internet, it's not affordable to most of the families. Given, for example, when the, the COVID started, so we all parents, we had our children trying to see or to have options, switch schools from one school to another school so that your children can continue uh, uh, pursuing education. For example, my children were able to get a school where they could run online. But our neighbors, family members, all the children were out of school. So which means few uh, children from these families were able to continue. Again, also struggling but we are able to continue education while others are left behind. So that is a, a divide on another layer on affordability. Affordability of the internet, because you have to pay monthly internet or daily bundles on what, so not many families can afford. So that's one. So it means our children, we can send them to school, but our neighbors, families, school kids are, are out of school because they cannot not only because, because they have connectivity, because we are all in the same city, we have connectivity, but it's not affordable to many families. That is also another area of, of digital divide, where they have connectivity, but not affordable in terms of paying the internet, but also devices, because I personally had to go and buy uh, laptops for my two daughters. Not all the families could go and buy laptops and send also send them to a school where they have, or the, we are, I think colleagues said about the platforms where the, the schools put, need to put up uh, platforms. Not all the schools, those private schools that, uh, you know, they have uh, 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 ICT policies, they have ICT infrastructures, ICT platforms and programs, they could continue with the online education. So that's another area. The first layer is on access where the rural communities, most of the part, those hard to reach regions are not connected at all and they're out of school. Another layer is the own affordability, where we have the connectivity in the cities, mainly in the cities, and still some uh, families, some children are not able to attend because they don't have, they don't, they don't afford the, the, the connectivity and the, the devices. That's on an, another layer. So another third layer is on accessibility. Then the, uh, we are talking about uh, policies, government policies, enabling uh, environment where the I, the ICT in education is, 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 is adopted. We are still also lacking in that, in, that, in that space. Then we are not talking about even those people with disabilities that don't have children, don't, don't have, uh, they are, I mean, they, they live with disability. They, I mean, they need special programs or, uh, 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 and policies enabling education for, for them. So that is uh, what, what uh, what, uh, what, what I can talk about the digital divide. So it's, it's a complex uh, 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 in Africa. But another thing that probably uh, colleagues also have, have uh, 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 previous, but the, another issue that I, I saw on divide, when you're talking about digital literacy, when I talk about literacy, we are talking about the children and, 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 and maybe uh, the students, but we are not talking about the, the, the teachers. Hmm? We have an issue in Africa, but the teachers themselves, 
they were not ready to, to, to teach online. Hmm? That's what I'm talking about, uh, uh, in, uh, the, the, the case of Africa. Because for example, where my, the school was a private school where my children was, were enrolled at the pandemic. The school had all the, uh, had tried to, to go to private school. They had tried to put in platforms, but the teachers were not able, were not equipped to conduct the teaching online. So they are used to, 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 to teach in person. So when you're talking about digital literacy, I think we need to add another layer of capacity development, skills development of teachers that to be able to conduct the, the year. Because many schools were out, of, out, out in the cities, were closed because not only they are because they have access, uh, probably even the, the parents might, might afford the devices, but the teachers themselves don't, they are, they don't, they are not uh, equipped enough to, uh, to run, uh, 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 to get, or to get, I mean, to get together and run uh, online courses because they are not prepared. They, the pandemic came as uh, abruptly and we could not, we could, they, could, they were not prepared for, for that. So, uh, and that's what I, I, I could say, but they, they then uh, when coming back to the youth, uh, what they, 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 the advice they, they are giving to the governments, uh, I'm going to come back later on that, but the first uh, was to achieve universal access. They, they, they called for partnerships, government, uh, uh, private, uh, civil society to come together to have a holistic approach on, uh, on infrastructure development first, because this cannot be done by the private sector, because we know that the private sector will not be interested to go into the rural areas, where that's where we need the governments to come in and uh, other uh, uh, to facilitate those partnerships to come up with innovative solution to, uh, to extend the connectivity to those rich, uh, hard rich uh, areas. But then uh, also, uh, again, uh, build the skills. The ITU now, we have a program called the Digital Transformation Centers where we, we partner with government to develop skills at the basic and intermediate, uh, intermediate level. It's, but focusing on, uh, most uh, importantly on uh, rural communities, not uh, vulnerable commu uh, 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 communities. So I think uh, I, I will stop. Uh, I will stop there by by now, and uh, I'm happy to to share more uh, uh, as we move on in the in the session. Thank you very much, and back to you. Uh, thank you very much, Emmanuel, uh, for all your inputs and uh, to all panelists. Uh, you will have uh, the chance uh, to provide comments uh, uh, later. Uh, but before we would like to find some time uh, for you to discuss uh, uh, in separate groups about different aspects that need to be taken into consideration when tackling digital divide and the importance of mainstreaming uh, digital literacy. That said, you, you now have the chance to join the breakout rooms online and on site and have the possibility to discuss the following questions. What can be learned from the COVID-19 uh, pandemic? If something similar like the COVID pandemic happens again, are we ready to respond? What action points should be uh, followed by the respective stakeholders from the public and private sector? And uh, share any good practices from your country that tackle digital inequality as well as social and economic inequality. Uh, so, uh, depending on the time that we have, and now we have uh, more or less 15 minutes to discuss, uh, I would like to ask uh, for the breakout rooms. Uh, you should uh, nominate a, a, a rapporteur uh, that uh, uh, will bring back the, the key ideas of, uh, of your discussion. Um, so as I said, the discussion will take about uh, 15 minutes uh, and afterwards we will be back uh, into the plenary to, to final feedback and, and takeaways. So I will ask the, the technical help if they can do uh, two breakout rooms uh, uh, online uh, for 15 minutes, please. And... It's no. It's working or not? Yes. Yes, I think now. Okay. Thank you, Sophia. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, fifteen minutes we have. Trinta e quatro. 
15 minutes. 15. Yeah, hmm? We also have 15 minutes here to discuss, yes. Mm. So would you like to share the, um, your uh, perspective about the matter? Is somebody here who would like to talk about his country? Yes, I will repeat the questions. So the questions that we are addressing the, the audience uh, are, what, uh, uh, first, what can be learned from the COVID-19 pandemic? If something similar like the COVID pandemic uh, happens again, are we ready to respond? Of course, in terms of digital divide, yes. Uh, what action points uh, should be followed by the respective stakeholders from the public and private sector? And the last one is if you have any good practice that you would like uh, to share from your country uh, tackling digital inequality as well as social and economic uh, inequality. Okay, welcome, first of all. Hi, uh, I'm Alex. Uh, I don't know if I can uh, reply to the questions, but uh, I have more questions for you guys. <laughs> uh, Perhaps if you have more questions, we can uh, uh, take them after. Uh, I think the important thing now would be to discuss uh, uh -huh. the questions because online they are also discussing the, the same questions. Yeah, yeah. Where do you come from as a status? <laughs> oh, yeah, I am from, I'm here representing the Digital Rights Explored podcast, uh, but I am from Brazil. So I also work with uh, media information literacy in schools. So we have projects that try to take audiovisual discussions to, to students. And um, yeah, it was really interesting to see the social impact, I think, of, of the digital divide. Because of course, we have all the problems that Rodrigo said. We knew that they weren't, going to be access that they weren't going to be able to follow through the education um but last month when i finally came back to school i saw the impact and we 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 met with high school students they were just finishing the last year of school and um it was incredible to see how they felt like strangers amongst themselves i tried to put on an activity and they felt strangers because they they spent the entire high school without getting to know each other so if we think back at, at our own, you know, periods in school, how important it was that connection, but they didn't have even internet to connect or to open the cameras. So, you know, that, that feeling of, of belonging, I think completely vanished. Mm -hmm. uh, but what I think would be curious to, to hear is that I feel, especially if we think about, are we ready for it again? And, and in terms of private and, and public stakeholders, because sometimes it feels like we're trying to do these digital programs to enhance digital literacy. And I imagine it must happen with the refugees as well. But it feels like we're in a ship that's sinking and we're trying to cover the holes, but we, we can't go fast enough with the tapes. Uh, it, it, it seems like we're just, you know, doing a emergency situation patching or something like that. So I'm wondering to, to hear from colleagues here as well, how can we, you know, make it a sustainable approach in the sense of integrating, you know, because I imagine every couple of years, you must have another wave of refugees as well to, to deal with. Mm. And it's not, the money doesn't come forever from the government. So how, how are you working on that? I think that would be one of the key ideas to be prepared for the next one, if we think about it. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. Would you like to add them? <laughs> uh, Thank you. Thank yeah, you for, is, for your input. Thank you. My name is Olu Femi from uh, Federal Minister of Communications, Abuja, Nigeria. Um, we have something similar to what he's talking about. The, we call them IDPs, Internet, Internet Displaced People. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the first thing we did was um, to call the um, body 
in charge of um, national identity to take a census of them and give them like an uh, identity card, something they can use to know the kind of people um, for planning purpose. And then the next thing was to establish, uh, would I say, uh, this kind of schools, what do you call this kind of um, mobile school under the tree with, with camp, mm -hmm. something like that. And then we took it over from there and then we put um, the support infrastructure there for dining purpose. Of course, uh, the, 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 the number is large, you understand what I'm saying? But the, uh, the, what we have is not enough to go around all of them. But we're able to at least get them educated. So that's what we do to the IDPs. IDPs? That's what we call them. Uh, Internally displaced, displaced people. Internet displaced yeah. people. Yeah. Okay, that's, that's very interesting that you are actually have uh, a name, Internet this for, yeah, I, I don't know, we, I haven't used it before, Internet Displaced People, so, okay. Um, so I, I, I didn't understand, is it uh, because of poverty in, in your country? Is it uh, uh, because of other reasons? Is it because, um, uh, why are these people Internet displaced people. Uh, attacks. Tax. Political attacks. Political attacks. A certain region. Okay. To the urban. And they need to move to another region. Yes. So they are kind of refugees. Yeah, that's it. In Ni Nigeria, you mentioned. Okay, of course. You you have the same problem, but from another point of view. So you're the one who are leaving. Exactly. You're, you're trying to, okay, um, this is a huge problem. So um, are, are you trying to tackle this problem? Uh, do you have uh, placed any measures uh, for, I don't know, that the problem might be even political, I guess. Uh, in a higher rank problem, I don't know. Yeah, that's what I said. The first thing is to get them together under a mobile um, shelter. Then we provide the infrastructure, the internet infrastructure. Then we provide teachers to take care of the children. Mm, yes, provide the teachers. Yeah. Mm. So the so, children are receiving the education um, with through this mobile, I mean, this like a caravan or mobile uh, camp or something, and they have access to the internet in this uh, uh, mobile facility as well. They do a little, a little bit, yes. Before the before the organizer for them, for the yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, so at the end of the day, the money can't buy it in the winter. I can't buy it because it's such a very expensive. <laughs> uh, I think money can buy it. In terms of provision of the infrastructure, money can buy. Why not? How do we make the money come to digital literacy? Mm. Uh, to, buy, to buy this infrastructure, put in place necessary infrastructure for people who are having the gap. Yeah, money can. But then, but, the, but then you, you also need the digital literacy. So you need uh, to, uh, to have uh, uh, teachers that can uh, teach uh, children and, and young people how to use safely uh, the internet and the, the devices that they are uh, 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 exploring. You need money to buy the devices. Yes. You need money to pay the resource prices. So money can buy. Money, money helps indeed. If you ask me to, <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. It's it's, <laughs> it's part of the it's, of solving the problem. It's part indeed, but it uh, sometimes. Then you have the, the capacity, all the capacity building, also to now how to use correctly the the internet mm. and and how to be safe uh, uh, online. And of course, now in the pandemic, when uh, uh, 
uh, we have this emerging situation, then sometimes even money is not enough to close the gap because of um, trying to uh, very fast to close holes, but it's only like you mentioned, it's like... Um, Yes, but we're all speaking about the pandemic and the situation here, I think, is much worse than yes. the pandemic because you have of course. of camps like, like these of people who are escaping their own countries. And mm -hmm. obviously the same in Greece, they find themselves in, in situations where they don't have access. Their children don't have access, not even to education sometimes. So mm -hmm. it's, it's the pandemic, but then there are other situations which are much yeah. much worse e exactly and sometimes we are focused on the pandemic and the pandemic and we forget that okay there is a pandemic there is a virus okay we are doing whatever we can about this but then we have some bigger problems and people have really bigger problems they are escaping their country and now they have nothing and yes and those are uh, those situations were before uh, were already before the, yes. the pandemic so it's it's something that we also need to to take into account when uh, we think about uh, the excess yes of course of course oh, seriously is there anything in this world that you can do without money is there anything at all seriously is there anything at all you can do without funding? I don't think there is anything you can do without funding, honestly. It's very, very essential. That's what I believe. No, I agree. I would say that the problem is to get the funding. The yes. People with money, for you to convince them that the real problem is for you to invest in digital literacy, mm. that's very tough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, very that's true. But you think that it's easier uh, to convince people to invest in uh, accessibility and to give device to people than to invest in a... Okay, okay, they are all at the same level. Okay, 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 yes. Yeah, the big picture. Mm. The ROI and their investment, I think that's one of the big issues, isn't it? Yeah, yes. and also I think we wouldn't have ended up with a lot of families not being able to provide a decent education during the pandemic mm -hmm. because they didn't feel the need to have access to a laptop, for example. They only gave devices to their children like a mobile phone, um, like a mobile device, but not a proper laptop to, to do research for school and all this. And then, you know, we have these families and, and uh, kind of trying to explain to them that you need an actual device to connect to your online lessons. And, and so if devices were provided, if there was funding for devices, I think there would be, there will still be families who wouldn't see the need, you know, what do I, why do I need a laptop when I can do anything from my, my mobile phone. device? Yeah. Yes, please. Um, I hope you can hear me. I'm coming from an organization called the Africa uh, Digital Rights Hub. I, I wanted to say that um, in, in discussing these digital device, um, especially from a developing country perspective, we need to also stress the importance of exploring the appropriate use of universal access funds um, to, to support, because these are some of the reasons why universal access funds have been developed. Um, and, and these are funds that usually people or, or MNOs contribute a certain percentage to help reach unserved and underserved areas. And I, I think that in order to bridge that gap, um, he's right. It's all about money and it's all about making these things available. And there are always places uh, and communities where businesses would never see it as, you know, a, a business 
priority to get there. And so we, we really need to explore how these funds can all equally be used. You know, in the past, it, it was used to provide telephony access in other areas. In, in some countries, it is being used to also provide some form of um, community information centers and the like. And I think that it is also very important that we explore how we can use some of these funds to enable digital literacy and bridge that digital device. So what, what uh, do we have right now from uh, takeaways from, I mean, up, till, up until now, we can, we can discuss uh, upon the takeaways, if you like. So not, hmm? 15 minutes have passed. I think. 15 minutes? minutes There the was questions. another question, which was, if something similar like the COVID pandemic yeah. happens again, are we ready to respond? And I think Alex answered that um, when he said, kind of, we can never be ahead, you know, sort of. No, no, not doomsday, <laughs> no. not doomsday <laughs> but, but uh, kind <laughs> of it's true, you know, we can never, I mean, I think this that's, has taught us a lesson that we, Nobody I agree if you want. I mean, uh, I totally agree that we have to be constantly behind events and run behind them, of course. That's what we actually do. So uh, it should be the other way around. But um, that uh, requires maybe that uh, young people and children are and uh, are provided with skills like, um, uh, how do you say, it? Uh, general skills of proactively, uh, I try to find the world, I try to find the words. So we have the, our participants back <laughs> from oh, okay. the breakout rooms. Yeah. I hope you had a productive uh, discussion. So now I will invite the rapporteurs to, to give us a, a briefly report uh, back. So perhaps I will start here with our rapporteur. Can you please give yes. us uh, the takeaways from uh, our discussion here, please? Yes, so basically we Thank have you. concluded. So it was concluded, let's say that money can, can actually buy you digital literacy. So we, we mentioned that it is important, obviously, that children have access to devices and that they have access to, to the internet. And um, there are some countries around the world who don't have this either due to political reasons because of um, uh, political situations. For example, our friend from Nigeria mentioned uh, the uh, internet displaced people and these are, are, are having access um, uh, to, to the internet and to education through a mobile, mo mobile camps due to political attacks. So we, we've seen how important also, apart from the pandemic, how there are other situations whereby children are being, um, are, are not having the right to, to education to, and to proper internet access. Um, we also, it was also mentioned that we need to um, try to keep ahead of situations, although it is not always possible to prevent and to be um, um, uh, the word uh, kind of, uh, we are, we cannot be ready for every kind of situation a little bit with the COVID, what happened with the pandemic that we weren't ready. So um, we're a step behind sometimes when, when these things happen and we need to have something in place in case um, uh, there's another <laughs> pandemic or, or another situation uh, which uh, brings us, I mean, where we need to, to, to find another solution. 
Um, okay, and an important point that was mentioned by Alex from Brazil was also the fact that he noticed from when he returned to college how um, uh, the young people were feeling and es estranged, I think you mentioned, and uh, um, uh, they had lost the connection, not only the physical connection, but also the fact that they couldn't connect um, with each other also um, online. They also lost the all all forms of all, all forms of connection. So it was like being strangers, um, uh, and and uh, they have lost the feeling of belonging, etc. So I think those were the main points that that came out from our session. Okay. Thank and you. The fundings and the fundings that yeah, the, the money ladies, can buy yeah, and that the fundings that, that the lady does, so that it is important for all these countries to 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 the get use the of funds, funds, yes, the appropriate, appropriate use, use of, of funds. funds. Yes. Thank you. So now I will go online. I don't. Who are the rapporteurs, Sabrina? Yes, I can be a reporter for um, our group, um, okay. which Thank was you. very, very small group, uh, mostly composed of the speakers, but we had nonetheless a very nice uh, discussion. Um, so one of the takeaways um, is that uh, it's pretty clear or the discussion we had already is pretty clear that the educational system was not um, ready. Um, for the challenge as the COVID-19 pandemic. It came very fast and there was no time. Uh, in many countries, schools closed almost immediately, so people were not um, really ready for it. Um, then it was also mentioned um, by one of the speakers that we do um, learn that in crisis we change and we try to adapt um, as much as possible. And in many countries, there was a response. Um, but um, in also in many countries, uh, the crisis response was not um, approached in a multi-stakeholder manner um, and um, also didn't necessarily prioritize um, human rights or human rights were not taken into consideration. Um, and um, Sonia made a very good point um, that, she, that she said that educators um, or schools were not ready for the pandemic, but certainly industry was. Um, they were ready to promote, they, they took the pandemic um, as an occasion to uh, promote big tech. Um, and uh, she highlighted, very important point, the crucial role of procurement, um, because um, the um, responses from many governments was um, to immediately provide a framework to the private sectors, um, to the tech companies. Um, but um, then, for example, a children's rights framework was not necessarily taken into consideration as well. Um, so, um, of course, we need the technology in, in a situation such as the COVID-19 pandemic, but we need to improve to take other um, aspects into consideration, just um, for example, um, children's rights. Um, and um, um, another point in this regards was also mentioned that uh, a more ethical approach needs to be taken from big tech, but also from smaller startups who are just entering the scene um, as well. So that's quite crucial. Um, we also talked a bit about the role of, for example, non-government organizations like European Schoolnet that I represent, um, but also the key role of the Safer Internet Centers, um, because um, um, a couple of Safer Internet Centers are indeed part or linked to the uh, to ministries, ministries of education or other ministries at national level, and they really play a key role to ensure that, for example, topics such as children's rights, safety online, other issues like mental health or well-being are basically taken into consideration and they provide materials in this regards as well. So it's not um, only about the um, uh, giving, um, teaching um, children and young people how to um, get online, but also navigate in, uh, in a, the internet in a safe space, also create empathy and um, make sure um, these kind of issues are also taken into consideration. So this is a bit of conversation we had. We mostly got stuck actually on the first question, um, but I think we, we um, got uh, quite a lot out of it. Thank you, Sabrina. And uh, how about the, the second? 
Yeah, I think that maybe is um, my, I, I made some notes, but Emmanuel, okay. please uh, jump in and also the others, if I uh, have something wrong, uh, please really uh, just jump in real quick. Okay. Um, yeah, we tried to focus on the F five minutes, question. Catherine, please. Yeah, yeah, sure. We tried to <laughs> focus you. on, no, no, it's not so much basically okay. because we only focused on one question. So um, what we first talked about is that um, in cases like this, of course, we now had like this pandemic, which uh, led to all um, the stuff we uh, we now know where the problems were, but we also talked that we have to have some warning systems in place uh, for the problems we now saw, but we then also have warning systems for the, the future that we in, in the future don't need a pandemic to see uh, where the problems are, but uh, we will see them uh, from the beginning and that we um, that if we see the increase of cases uh, of problems that we can have uh, good responses and also quick information on um, on those points. Uh, also a point was that we have to um, upgrade uh, protocols in the public sector so that all those file processing and all the ways you have to go in the public sector are loosened up and that you introduce um, digital platforms there so it's all a bit easier to to uh, to attend and also this would be probably bridging the digital divide if it's easier for everyone and um, then also we had the uh, the example of how the private sector was um, uh, doing their their using their own resources um, in this in this whole point and also giving their money uh, for for um, education and for ideas. I think those were like the three points we talked about much. And also, we really also had the question if uh, money uh, maybe is helping uh, in this. So yeah, that was real quick what we were talking about. Thank you, Catherine. Does someone has uh, something yeah, that yeah. would like to, to add? Yes, uh, just maybe on the second question, I think you mentioned about the second question. I think if a similar, uh, a similar pandemic or COVID or another similar pandemic comes, we are still not yet, re yet ready to respond. Probably uh, in the case of Africa, uh, during the COVID-19, I can say maybe 98% of schools and the students were out of school. Probably we, if another one comes, we maybe we might get maybe to 95, maybe 90, but that's not a, a, a good percentage. So we might maybe, because we, we have some private schools that are trying to implement, government also putting in efforts. So we might reduce the, the, the number of students out of school, but not uh, to, to where we, we want to be. So it was 98. If another pandemic comes, we have again 90% of students and children out of school. So we are not ready yet. That means that there are a lot to be done. There are a lot of, uh, to be done from the government side, private, come together. Money cannot solve the problem. The private sector will put in everything, we put in everything. But the parents, the students, the teachers, they are not yet ready to in embrace the online running. So money cannot buy the literacy. So we need to train, we need to train teachers, we need to train children. I mean, digital literacy needs to, this whole of the things that needs to be done to be where we are. So that's maybe what I can add at this point. We are not ready yet. Thank you, Emmanuel. Um, now, I, I don't know, Sabrina, do you have some questions from uh, the online participants that you would like to address to our panelists? Uh, we don't have any questions written so far in the chat, but uh, mm. we can encourage once again um, yes. participants to to do so or maybe raise their hand um, and I'm sure we could also bring them in um, mm. if they have any questions or comments for our speakers. Uh, and here on site, would you like to address a question to our panelists? No. Yes, thank you. <laughs> so we, we start from here, Sabrina. Hey everyone, uh, how's it going? I am Alex from Digital Rights Explored podcast and uh, I'm going to kind of repeat myself here, but I think it, these are good topics good to discuss on um, because I'm wondering now how, how to make, you know, digital literacy appealing to people because we're like, can money solve it? Can't money solve it? I think the difficult thing is to, you know, engage with the stakeholders and make them understand that, you know what, digital literacy is actually worth it. 
and we should focus on this. And, and, and it's one of the best things that we can do for the future of our societies, children, teenagers, even adults. So I'd like to hear a little bit of the experience of, of, of you. Um, how have you been doing that in your own projects to kind of secure that funding for the long run and, you know, maybe engage with the public sector, sector as well and, and all that? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So from the panelists uh, who would like to, to answer to this uh, or to comment. Uh... Can I, may I kick off? Yes. Thank you, Sonia. Please. Um... Uh, thank you. It's a great question and one that I've um, thought a lot about. Um, so when I talk to children um, and young people, mainly in Britain, uh, they are um, really tired <laughs> of um, the idea that what digital literacy means is um, the same e-safety lesson over and over again. It's not that they don't care about safety um, or um, safety online but they feel as if they are, they get a message over and again, which says you are responsible. Um, if something goes wrong, we will blame you. Um, it's a big bad world and it falls on your shoulders. And so the messages become very simple and very repeated and children roll their eyes. But um, a project I did for our um, data protection authority a couple of years ago, I went into schools and I asked them about data literacy and privacy literacy and what they wanted to know. And they were so enthusiastic. They wanted to know so many things. Where does their data go? Who gets their data when they die? What happens? Where who, does their digital footprint go to their future employer? Um, how do they find out these things? How can they? They, they wanted to know many things. I think young people are very enthusiastic to learn about the digital world and they feel it's their right and they feel it's their world, but they know it's complex and people are not telling them the answers. They want to know about e-safety in relation to um, relationships, sex education, pornography, all the things that adults are too embarrassed to tell them. That's what they want to know. So if we were to, and, and this is an important body of knowledge, um, so, so I think, you know, start with the questions that kids have and then let's stop patronizing them and let's stop making them feel responsible and um, they are ready to learn. I really believe that. Yeah. Thank you so much. I just want to add this possible uh, that uh, everyone sometimes are feeling powerless and we especially facing big tech companies and sometimes facing government and users and citizens are, are feeling powerless. Uh, what, I can I, what can I do? And remember that we as users also have some power, not only the only responsibility, but as consumers, even uh, in our systems, we have powers to consume or not consume something. And all this broad education about the, the, the roles and responsibilities uh, around uh, uh, consum 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 consumers uh, is important also to, to to not leave that only for specialized forums like this one that we have uh, all technical issues to discuss, but to make more larger uh, discussion about what we consume when we are talking about technologies and what change they bring for our lives uh, that are interconnected with all other areas of our lives. So bring this more larger conversation about life and, cons and, and what we consume and what we choose in daily base could be interesting also just adding that uh, that point that Sonia brings that when we start talking with what they need and what they want to know and discuss it's really nice and you can after that as adults uh, invite them to reflect about these more large uh, responsibilities that we share thank you Rodrigo. um and uh, before closing today's uh, uh, workshop, uh, um, I would like to ask our uh, technical support if they could uh, uh, pass the, the video that we gave to you, please, now. It's a, a video that Rodrigo sent to us with the Youth uh, um, South Global uh, uh, Voices. Mm. No, we don't have... Thank you. 
Hi everyone, I'm Lorena Villas Boas. I'm from Brazil, and it's urgent that we guarantee our boys and girls have access to high quality internet connection, especially the ones from vulnerable communities. And it's also necessary that we ensure digital literacy is part of the basic curriculum at schools, also teaching our boys and girls how to use this internet power in a safe, respectful and responsible way. Enquanto jovem indígena e embaixadora do programa Cidadão Digital de 2021, gostaria que a inclusão digital fosse uma janela para outros jovens indígenas de todo o país brasileiro, assim levando vozes de resistência e fortalecimento de identidade cultural, principalmente no mundo digital. Assim fazendo a diferença para a diversidade cultural brasileira. Pois o acesso à inclusão digital é um direito para todos. Para romper com as assimetrias de acesso à tecnologia, é preciso ouvir o que as juventudes amazônidas vêm há muito tempo gritando. A necessidade de projetos que focalizem a região amazônida e a tecnologia. A necessidade de projetos que escutem a juventude e emancipe essa juventude para que possa se inserir não só no mercado de trabalho, mas como na promoção e manutenção da floresta em pé. Afinal de contas, falar sobre acesso à tecnologia não é falar somente sobre lazer e educação, mas é falar sobre política pública de proteção integral a todos e ao meio ambiente. Thank you, uh, Rodrigo, for uh, uh, catching this uh, video. Uh, and now I will... Uh, uh, invite uh, Emmanuel for uh, uh, the last words, that he also has some uh, words from the, the Africa youth that he would like to share with us. We thank you very much. Thank you yeah, very much. I'm going... Two uh, minutes, uh, Emmanuel, because yeah, we are thank really, you very much. really running I'm going, out yeah. of time, please. Yeah, thank you very much. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to read out the identified actions by the youth in the, in the, in the, in the Africa region. Uh, but, uh, established by ITU. So the first one is uh, they called for uh, following actions, achieve universal broadband access for all in Africa. The internet is no more a luxury. It is a basic human right. Governments, partners should provide the financial support to digital innovations that take into consideration the needs of marginalized groups and the people with disabilities. Creation of communities of young uh, digital local ambassadors which will help promote the digital services in their schools, communities, and help address uh, digital literacy in their, their countries. Create multi-stakeholder collaboration and partnership platforms to holistically address the digital skills gaps by giving youth access to digital skills training programs, not only limited to schools and online training, but to be expanded to include in-person training and trainers, facilitators, and peer-to-peer -peer exchanges. Establish sustainable digital hubs with free internet and the computer access and a stable electricity to enable the youth to have access to different digital opportunities ranging from online training program to online jobs. Digital hubs, young beneficiaries will be motivated to develop innovative uh, solutions to community challenges and transfer digital, digital skills to other youth in their communities. Provide an enabling environment, inclusive policies, regulations for youth for all backgrounds to have access to internet services and they acquire digital skills. Thank you. Thank you, Emmanuel. I, I would like uh, to thank all the panelists for uh, the amazing uh, interventions. And uh, to finish, Catherine, the, the floor is yours. And uh, uh, what thank would you, you. like? I will... Like a tweet. <laughs> what would you like? <laughs> I, will be, I will be real quick. We <laughs> just heard from Emmanuel what great ideas young people and children are having about all of the, the problems um, we just uh, talked about. So um, basically, I think my, my last word would be that governments and industry need to, need to take those issues and problems which are raised and also the, the ideas to tackle them really seriously and involve young people from all over the world with different cultural backgrounds, educational backgrounds and family backgrounds in in, in the process. So uh, that's also something we are trying at the moment to put young people into youth advisory boards and to advise uh, governments and industry on that because, um, you know, like we are the future and we're the vehicle of change and we have uh, great ideas uh, to tackle all those problems. So please, um, yeah, do uh, invite us in the process. I guess that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine. I, I think it's a, a very, very good uh, uh, 
uh, outtake for, for, uh, from this uh, uh, workshop. Well, me as a, a coordinator of the Portuguese Safer Internet uh, Day, and I'm here with uh, my colleague from Greece and my colleague from, uh, from Malta. There is a last word that we would like to, to say is uh, to invite uh, all of you to celebrate the Safer Internet Day that next year will be mm. on the 8th of February. So it's uh, uh, a huge day for us to, to raise awareness uh, on uh, uh, how to be safe online and uh, about uh, uh, digital uh, literacy. So thanks a lot, everyone, for uh, being here uh, today with us. And I wish you a pleasant day. Thank you. Thank you, Sophia, for so the much. great work. Thank you, Sophia. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for Thank everything. You. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks to Katarzyna. Bye. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.